Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this workshop called uh, all about a PV canopies, multifunction solar energy. So it can be used by individuals, com communes, businesses. This is not quite yet an everyday uh, good, but uh, everybody is uh, talking more about it, particularly here at Enagaya. And that because it corresponds to a need. Our, our con energy consumption is changing, it's growing. We're using more um, energy pumps, we're using less uh, cars that use fossil fuels. We are adopting to 200 electric vehicles to over 2 million electric vehicles by the end of this year. So that gives you an idea of the change in scale. And there's also there's that crossroads of these, uh, the growth of the increase in electricity cost and the cost of the PV watt which has been produced, which is quite low. If you add this uh, automization desire, plus COVID, plus the war in Ukraine, and law, which is being a bit harsh on parking lots. You add all of that together and you find a rather promising market for PV canopies combined with charging up electric vehicles. This afternoon's workshop it's not really talking about the technical aspects of these canopies and these charging stations, although we may brush upon that. Our speakers are going to talk about the business models that are available today for local authorities and businesses to develop these installations in a large scale on their land. There's, so there's an econo economic point of view, so how do I go about it? What kind of partnerships do I need? What usages, what services, what management tools, what kind of charging stations, and how do I need to be helped along the way? We've got four speakers who are going to be talking to us about the subject of canopies. We've got uh, Tangi Pupa Lafarge, who's project manager of smart charging at Drive France. We're going to have a, a duet performed by Francois Guérin, who founded CU CERN, and Nicola Gent, who is at the top of SEM uh, Avergy. They're going to be working together. And then we've got someone who's a very loyal attendant of the uh, Enagaya. It's Richard Loyer, general manager of Enerplan. So good afternoon, all four of you. So we're going to start with you, Richard Loyer. You represent Enerplan. This is the yes. trade uh, union or the trade syndicate of this sector. You have been working with LAVER, which is the National Association for Mobile uh, Electric Mobility. And you work on pairing up a PV and electric vehicles. You have just released a new study which uh, aims to develop the synergies between those two ecosystems. So before we listen to you to sum up what that survey found, I have a question for you. Why has Enerplan uh, targeted this particular sector, i.e. PV uh, canopies and electric vehicles? Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So we noted that electric vehicles are batteries on wheels. And so the problem with PV is that we produce uh, electricity in a rather haphazard way and we need to store it somehow. Uh, a st storage at a marginal cost is called an electric vehicle because you're not really buying your electric car to store um, electricity, but it can be used to that end. So we thought those were two things which paired up quite nicely, and that's what our survey has confirmed. It was the first time we carried out the survey, but was before COVID in 2019. We released it in 2020. So we decided to uh, have a look again at things this year. Yes, so a lot more vehicles, electric vehicles are around now. Has that evolved a lot in the ecosystem, if you look at those two uh, channels? Not as quickly as that, in fact. At Energaya, I can see more and more charging stations that are being presented and different uh, steering systems. However, it has to be noted that the integrated supply of PVs plus charging station plus the steering, storing and the other facilities for smart charging and smart storing, that integrated office is very little developed. 
Uh, it's kind of on the shelf still. It hasn't really been uh, launched into the market. So that's what we have noted. I'd just like to remind you that we wanted to study electromobility in the future because we'd heard that there were some wind turbines that were charging up these uh, batteries. But uh, wind turbines are not really being used. Well, why is that? Because they're further removed from the charging, they're far away from the charging stations. So if we're talking about uh, collective um, uh, cell, uh, collect self uh, supply, you, you've got a limit. You can't go, you can't be too many kilometers away from the charging station. What about on the edge of uh, motorways, for example? Would that be a possibility? Well, you know, we can't put wind turbines in the centre of Montpellier, for example, just to power up a charging station. So what have you learned from your survey? And what recommendations does Enerplan give? Well, the first one is why does one need to pair up these uh, PVs and EVs? I was really pleased to read that others are recommending this. Uh, Self-supply means that you're not taking energy off the grid for your cars. If you're doing smart charging, you can increase the power of your charging station. You'll be able to charge it more quickly and you'll be able to store, if you want to, stationary storage system. So the challenge here is not to overload the grid. We want to use local production, direct consumption and consumption in off-peak times. And these vehicle to grid or to home or to anything else uh, are not really very well developed today, not very mature today. So is that for technical or economic reasons? Well, I think we've got these uh, standards. Uh, my colleague is more specialized about this. He's going to talk about it. I think today we've got a very relevant model but it's not really been very developed. And I think next year we'll be able to have an entire conference uh, on use cases and development details than we can do today. Because if I take a look at what's out on the stands today, it'll be in the market next year. Some one hurdle is the visibility on ROI. When you buy a recharging station for your home or for your business, and those who service these uh, charging stations, I think that that pairing up is rather dodgy and dicey, and uh, we haven't got the regulations to surround them either. We've got local authorities that will have one department which takes place of deploying uh, PV, another will be in charge of renewable energies. They're not in the same office, not even in the same building sometimes, and the two programs, the two deployment schemes, are not really thought out together. Yes, Sem Avergy will tell us a little bit about that later on. So what is the main problem here? Is it an organisational issue? Do we need the public authorities to provide support and give some guidelines? Well, public assistance could be given. We've got some German colleagues. I think they've got a bonus, €10,000, if you purchase PV plus storage plus a charging station with an intelligent software to do smart charging. So because we, they don't want to overload their grid. That doesn't exist in France today. There, we need to update our regulations and we cannot recharge our batteries from the grid and then re-inject that electricity back into the grid. That's, it, that's forbidden. So we can talk about self-supply of stationary storage and perhaps re-inject it from time to time, but it's not allowed at the moment from, by law. And so these are certain things which need to be sorted out in terms of the regulation. One of the main recommendations that we've come up with is communication. Today there's some feedback from all over the place, even in this region here. However, we need to document that feedback, we need to publish that feedback, we need technical solutions to be broadcast, whether we're talking about hardware or software, so that we can do smart charging and ensure that local authorities will embrace that. We have to do some calls for projects so that this type of project will multiply today. There is a, a subsidy, there are subsidies available, but we really need to think about those zones where that would count most. Uh, there are some interconnected zones which uh, can't uh, do self-supply yet. 
even though uh, there are some subsidies, etc. And in these particular areas, in Corsica, for example, where you could uh, encourage electromobility, it would be very useful to have smart charging and immo um, immobile storage. So just to give you one statistic, one kilowatt of PV gives you five to 10,000 kilometers in an electric vehicle per year. So when you take a look of the cost of one kilowatt of PV and you compare that with how much it would take in petrol terms, then uh, I think uh, we've said it all. Thank you very much, Richard, for summing that up so nicely. Are there any questions in the room yet? Does anyone need any further details about what has been said? Any uh, details from uh, Richard Loyan? of Enaplan. I think you've been very clear, Richard. I could just give another detail here. Uh, we need to teach people about the regulations, I think. I don't know if you know the different uh, more laws and laws about mobility that uh, if you are if you are a building that receives the public, you have to reserve a certain number of parking spaces in your car park for electric vehicles. And so when you have a car park with, of over 1,500 square meters, you have to have some solar panels in it. But the uh, Deadlines aren't the same. I think there's not going to be any penalty if I don't put up a canopy. I don't think I'm going to get a fine. But and if I don't have a charging station, I don't think I'm going to have. A, I'm going to be fined either. Although that needs to be cleared up. So either I do this at higgledy piggledy, and I'll have my uh, canopy by 2026. Then 2028, I'll put some charging stations. However, it's better to think about these things in both hands so that you can make savings in costs and do everything all at once and to have your canopies with all of the different trenches that you need to dig and make sure that everything is uh, deployed at latest. And my colleague, I think, see you soon, is going to be saying something different about that so that you can put all the cables in place at the same time. Yes, we will be talking about this in, in a moment, unless there are any questions. Oh, yes, there's a question. So the microphone will be brought to you. You're on the second row there. Wait for the microphone, please. Otherwise, we won't be able to hear you. And just perhaps say who you are as well. Godfrey Bonneau. I work at ASNEF. I'm an assistant project manager for solar products. I've got a question about these charging stations. I've seen on the web that rather than charging up your battery, at a charging station, there are some batteries that can be replaced. So there's a system for replacing your battery. To deal with this question of how long it takes to charge up the batteries, are you going to do any R&D in that direction? That is a system, that was the first system that was developed, or rather it was de developed in Israel to begin with. Since then it's been re-imported in France, not for vehicles, but for scooters, for motorbikes. And uh, it's really successful for these uh, electric uh, scooters, electric mo motorbikes. And uh, you have this scooter, you can go all over the town, there are charging stations with uh, battery racks, and when your battery is almost empty, you simply go take your empty battery, battery out and you put a full battery back in your scooter, and that's a kind of circular economy. And that does uh, satisfy a need, it's a very clear need, it's very practical. And uh, these uh, batteries for scooters are much uh, smaller, of course, and it's much easier to change it rather than well, when you compare it with a car. Yeah, I could also say that it works really well in a closed circuit. So if you've got a single owner, then there's no problem about switching batteries. You get a problem, however, when you have different manufacturers of battery and you've got a battery of one brand and you want to change it for another brand, you're not sure about the compatibility. So when you've got several operators, it's much more difficult. That's why it didn't work in Israel, for example. However, in a closed circuit, I think then that's what uh, the WEG is doing in that so uh, that's working quite well and that's why it is a success. Well what could you not have some standards? Like there are standards in other sides. I think you can put standards for everything of course. So I'd like you to keep on to the mic and uh, so Francois Guerin perhaps you can say a few words. Let's talk about practicalities with a business model that combines service and production of electricity in a, a very closed circuit, a tiny circuit, near to the public authorities. This is a concept of uh, municipal canopies, if you like. 
Sam Evergis uh, is in the Lot and Garon, and they have got plenty to talk to us about this subject. So, but first of all, with you, Francois Guérin, we started talking about this when you'd been working for major accounts at uh, Direct Energy, and you co-founded in 2017 a company called CU Sun. It's located in Brittany, and your concept is. Uh, uh, red, ready to roll solutions for uh, renewable energies, including car park canopies and charging stations. There may be some pictures for us to see. We might see a, an example of something in the Lot and Garonne region. So, Francois, if I am a local council or if I'm a business and I hope to fit up my car park. What kind of funding options are there and what kind of advantages are there? Well, the first thing, if you look at the history of PV, you need a, an investor, for example. So you can rent out your land and make sure that CapEx is externalised to the electricity producer. This is a way of uh, working that kind of uh, plant. And then you can use electricity in a very local circuit. Today, the canopy model is working rather well because it means that you can scale things up. And that is one subject which brought us to position ourselves in this sector. It's because there are more and more canopies and it's very easy to program such scale-ups rather than on rooftops, whether you're renovating a building or building new buildings. But we've got some structural studies and when you've examined uh, the uh, roof, uh, structure, etc., it's much more difficult to take all of that into consideration when you're trying to scale things up. Our examples are very simple. It's very good common sense. We're just putting canopies on land which has been artificialized and you can imagine producing electricity there and that is uh, blending into the environment so given the m economic model recharging is just another component yeah indeed uh, we see how our towns are developed when we open a road for example uh, you, you kind of dig up the road to put different uh, fiber cables down there, do your water pipes, etc. We see that when we launched CU Sun, the idea, uh, we're a bit like Jeremy Rifkin, it's a third industrial uh, revolution. There are things that need to be done in a pooled manner. And so and it's this kind of crossover place which was of interest to us. On the one hand, we've got the electrification market which is rolling in and for mobility of course it's electric mobility that's one of the main pillars anyway and on the other hand we've got pv uh, mass rollout and uh, everyone's uh, familiar with pv and the cost of pv it's very it's, it's it's got social acceptability i don't need to go through all of the reasons again but it was absolutely obvious that it would be a massive rollout so we said that to ourselves that let's take advantage of the deployment of solar energy which is going to take place in france in europe so that we can uh, have a mass scale of the pre-equipment and so that we can do town planning and usage all at the same time when i'm designing something i want to design it in a way which is uh, viable over time with services for electric mobility, soft mobility such as the, the bicycle, uh, setting up open air facilities. We can talk about that later on with our canopies. The idea really was to make this canopy multifunctional because we are in a transition and we are going to have to be thinking of usages of the future. And the business models with these char charging stations, well, we haven't really got them today. There are some... Uh, Mm, business models that uh, have been uh, preempted by local uh, uh, authorities. There's a, there's a charge charging station at the business for the fleet of business cars. There are different business models. However, our job as a producer is to have the producer as part of the uh, planner of sustainable solutions. So we think globally how a site is going to be used and how it will evolve over time. Charging stations are one aspect, but there are other corollaries which are better taken into account. What about an example? The example 
that uh, it's just next door to, is that not Pic Saint-Loup? It's saint Mathieu de Trévier, it's not far from here, it's at the uh, municipal uh, sports stadium. So if someone comes to see you to talk about these PV canopies could, and ask you, could you not do anything else perhaps for vehicle charging? And Richard was saying that it might be a problem of softwares, technical problems. Is that you, the added value that you bring? Is yours the tool that, that might have been missing up until now? Well, it's not that we don't have the tools, it's just you know, have to use them. We're talking about these big building blocks. I think we've got all kinds of solutions to uh, trigger this uh, energy transition. We have to do things right. We have taken a vertical axis, which is town planning with PV uh, canopies and annexed services. Uh, Nicholas is here. He'll be able to give you some examples. But we know that alongside the, we need players uh, on the territory to deploy them. On, at the bar, top left, you've got Brax, and uh, this is a co-investment, a co-development with SASEM. With our, and then on the right, you've got Maya, which is a, a medical uh, centre, co-invested with the the region. Bottom left, you've got a co-investment with the Arec. Arec is is which is the Occitania uh, Energy Association. Thanks to the regional policy which because the local region wants to be energy positive and so altogether we are co-planning that we've got these different places that has land they want to electrify it they need they have their uses with their different needs so we um, scale up and that can give other ex ideas for other examples we've got um, those sports stadiums we don't only have to be at car parks we can be elsewhere as well and how about the charging needs who estimates those is it the user i.e the local authority and how is that incorporated into the funding plan and how do you manage that so you've got your, your authority uh, i'm an authority i'm not going to be managing the charging stations but there are different models you can put the charging stations in and they may be covered by a rent uh, which is paid perhaps to the uh, local authority and the local authority then has a department which takes care of that or with a partnership with us with a specialist in uh, stations charging stations energy also uses uh, solar infrastructures to produce energy for uh, their electric vehicle charging points and th that has taken place in many different regions it will all depend on the usage and the region there's no point in putting a charging station where there's no vehicles going by where there's no traffic but we do see that occasionally yes indeed we do because it's a political need to demonstrate you want to show that you've got a charging station and you can understand that but sometimes sadly it's underused because uh, there aren't enough electric vehicles in france we're only about three percent of electric vehicles in france but things will speed up very very soon rapport à la notion de service je trouvais ça intéressant parce que il y a, y a, y a dans, dans vos systèmes interesting in terms of services there are several types of fundings in your system. There is also the system with uh, zero rent in exchange for a service, which means that, well, it's uh, quite uh, audacious, uh, but it also reflects a change in uh, the frame of mind of uh, collectivities and of citizens, uh, because you now have in mind a focus on users. That's true. When we created the first canopies, people came to see us and say, well, you're creating a canopy in Vichy. And it didn't look very convincing. People said to us, oh, you're covering up uh, car parks and so what? But some uh, communes uh, wanted to, to commit to solar development and now they are starting to see that it's a question of resilience there's a game changer thanks to collective self supply now when uh, towns or local authorities accept to uh, install a canopy it's not a loss of value it's about producing electricity that's going to be used to to 10 kilometers around the plant so they can think in terms of cars charging bikes soft mobility in fact under your canopy you can have some bike renting rent, rental or uh, 
you can host services. You may have ten, a fleet of ten vehicles for the services for for the local authorities. So. It's when we talked about the third industrial revolution, people said uh, we were crazy. But now the time has come. We are at the very heart of it. So it's up to us now to have uh, this uh, new state of mind and develop the pragmatic angles. Uh, we have a, a huge potential between 300 and 500 kilowatt hours in France for, for public uh, places. And uh, canopies could be on car parks, stadiums, buildings, public buildings. We could reach 100 giga by, by 2050, but we already have 18 Gaia now, so you, it, it could provide a, a good part of the electric consumption of a village. It, it really seems consistent. Let's give the floor to your neighbors, and we will hear questions later on. So this was a very interesting uh, testimony. Now we have the same avergy with us, with Nicolas Jante. Nicolas, you work with CU Sun. We have that picture of uh, the commune of Brax. You have uh, some 30 canopies under construction. Please tell us about your choices uh, regarding the economy or the legal aspects. You could have worked on your own. Why did you choose co-development? When you were created in 2019, energy unions were players that no one knew, but they, they all our communists in France were in uh, uh, such uh, a union. Uh, communes are owner of uh, the grid in the lot -Garonne. It's a 70 years ago experience. But now things have changed, and we must be the actors of this transition. So we base ourselves on the 319 communes of our region. When we were created in 2019, we were meant to accelerate transition. So we tried to be as efficient as possible with the means that we had. We tried to identify the most appropriate technical solutions. The first idea that came to our mind, uh, given that we had the opportunity to work with Francois and Kevin, to work with Siusen. So their first idea was to work on car parks because we know very well that it's the best place for solar canopies. This is where you uh, get the most support. People like to have canopies over car parks. So it was one of our first projects. We were a very small structure, understaffed with little experience. We could build on the skills offered by CU Sun, and we were then able to offer consistent solutions to communes and, and players in their territory without entering into uh, confidential details. How do you operate? There's a SEM which represents the collectivity. What, what's the agreement? We have created a common ident entity called Embraer uh, Solar. Uh, both actors are, uh, own 50% of it. We work together on projects. They are co-funded. And CU Sun is in charge of uh, construction. The charging of vehicle, is it is it systematic or does it depend on where you park your car? And is it integrated in that uh, common company. No, it is not systematic. It depends on the needs. And the 
Energy Union has developed its network of charging stations, which is a, a regional network. And you have those charging stations in, in the communes which are not necessarily used, but they started to appear 10 years ago. And even when they are not used, they uh, are becoming part of the landscape. Yes, there's one in my village, but a tractor is always parked uh, uh, on that spot. Yes, but it's a way to show the way. Perhaps you're going to lose money, but it's... Uh, a way of promoting a better integration. And the tipping point was clearly 2022 for electromobility. You can see it on all graphs. It is because of the war in Ukraine. I'm not sure it is, but perhaps it was a factor. But let's say that it's a question of maturity of vehicles certifications, lower prices, Tesla, the Chinese, the European perhaps are lagging behind, but it's because batteries cost went down. Anyway, we work on a case by case basis when we receive a request. At the moment, we develop our canopies on, on uh, private car parks. And we also build multi-energy stations because electricity is the best possible solution for private vehicles and small vehicles but for larger vehicles it's uh, bio uh, fuel biogen and when you want to be efficient for energy transition and face climate change challenge. If you want to decarbonate heavyweight transport, you must bet on Biogen V. So we have Biogen V stations. We've combined together with uh, an electrical charger. So we provide multi-energy so as to bring the appropriate answer. This is our role. We can't be mono energy. For us, hydrogen in mobility is, uh, I'll be frank, it's uh, a gadget. When you work on hydrogen, you uh, don't work on mobility. We have to decarbonate heavy vehicle transport, heavy transport in f five years' time, and we don't have the same levies as uh, we may have with electricity. Okay, we are not going to venture on that uh, territory. And before giving the floor to the audience, a few words on funding. Do uh, communes fund the projects? As you operate on private uh, properties, do you need private funding as well? Uh, well, it's uh, one third of solar accounts that is uh, investing up to 30%. And usually, th there, there may be some cases of co-investment, but usually uh, the one-third investment is the rule. Are there any questions in the audience on the CUSAN model, on, on the communal canopies, or on the example of the Lot and Garonne region? Are there any questions? Usually questions comes, uh, come at the end when there is no time left, so... Uh, Perhaps it's the right time now for asking the first question. If not, you may have a chance to ask your questions right at the end. I have a question. What about participative, participative investment? 
uh, you are developing usages in the very heart of villages or towns, so you meet some needs. So is it obvious? Participative investment is what we do for our ground, grounded plants, but we have never had any requests for cannabis. Uh, it uh, would be uh, conceivable, uh, but as it happens, uh, we have this only for grounded plants. All right, if we don't have any question, we are going to move on to the next speaker. Tongi, please go and get a microphone. So before, before questions, our last speaker is Tanguy Poupar Lafarge, um, project leader in s smart charging in Drève, France. Sometimes, if there is a strong political will, it can accelerate things. In this case, Drive suggests we use the battery of electric vehicles as a storage device, what is called V2. G, vehicle to grid. And in your case, you are encouraging the coupling with canopies. But you are not installing solar PVs, but you are using it and rejecting it in the grid. You have about 100 megawatt of capacity, installed capacity. Tongi, can you explain all of this and give uh, some concrete examples of, of what you are doing with Sanofi in the Gar region? Can you explain about that uh, vehicle-to-grid concept? Thank you. I'd like to thank my co-speaker for their presentations. What they said is very relevant to what I'm going to say myself. We have uh, an analytical vision. And we saw it is relevant to connect PV with loading uh, charging stations. Uh, we have the notion of uh, footprint, footprint on the ground, and we can reuse installations. The idea would be to steer charging on the basis of PV production so that we wouldn't have two infrastructures next to one another, but two communicating, interacting structures which would uh, complement each other in a smart way. GRID is a subsidiary of EDF. We offer several smart charging solutions, including the V2G technology. It consists in using batteries of vehicles as a way to store electricity so as to recharge at the best moment when electricity prices are low, for instance, and then unload when the grid is under pressure, when there's a peak in demand, which would encourage people to use gas or coal plants, which we don't want. This technology is very promising. It would be highly beneficial for the grid and for users. And at present, very few electric vehicles are compatible. It's on the roadmap of, of many players, but we are still waiting for these vehicles to be compatible. So it, it's a different kind of battery. No, it's a problem with the interface between the uh, charging station and the battery. So it, it's within the vehicle. At present, we are working on Nissan vehicles. And this is why we are developing the V1G, which is parallel to V2G and focuses on the steering of charging only. So we focus in the framework of, of a program that we implement in the Occitania region, which is called Flexitania. So we focus on the steering of charging on the basis of PV production on a given site. This is what we do with Sanofi, but I'll come back to this later. So in a few words, how does it work? We are charging when PV production is at the highest. So it works mainly on private car parks. You have employees getting there in the morning, staying the day, 
they will get there at 8 a.m. and they will start recharging at that time. If you want to optimize self-supply of one site, 8 a.m. is not the best time, especially at this time of the year. So we are steering the uh, charging, so we make sure that the vehicle is going to be loaded by the end of the day. But if it has 50% charge already, you don't absolutely need to start charging at 8 a.m. You can wait until the best PV production times. So we have analytical tools which help us to take into account the orientation of uh, solar panels, their uh, power, and make sure we charge at the best time and optimize self-supply and at the same time make more earnings and uh, use more decarbonated electricity, hence reducing CO2 emission. What are the advantages? First of all, uh, you can limit the charge depending on the available capacity. Sometimes you don't even need to do extra work. As we said, uh, it's, it doesn't always run smooth in terms of funding, so the two systems are not necessarily installed jointly, but we can come in later when uh, a PV solution is already in place, we take it into account and optimize the charge under constraint. This is how we define ourselves. We are optimizers under constraint to do at best whilst preserving the interest of users. These are our promises. Powerful mobility and electricity production, low price, and origin of the electricity with PV. So this project is being developed in this Flexitania program. It is the Sanofi Aramon program, which we have announced yesterday here. It consists of installing 45 charging stations with another subsidiary of EDF called Isilia. And we are going to steer charging on that site that has 4 megawatts and will increase uh, its PV production through canopies later on. And we work with uh, the employees on site, and we want to offer this to all companies and uh, local authorities in Occitania. We would encourage them to, uh, to offer this service. A system of, of funding so as to develop this system. Yes, we saw the earnings, uh, monetary earnings. What's the, the advantage and for whom? Th those uh, kilowatt hours, who do they benefit to? They benefit to Sanofi and could also benefit any other company or a local authority. And by the time they, you buy the charging station, we can offer a, a system whereby we optimize your consumption. So we act as an, an optimizer of, of charge. What's the benefit for employees concretely? The advantage for employees uh, will have to be negotiated with the employer. We will optimize local self-supply, whereby we will uh, raise the amount of electricity available for the company, which can then, in turn, offer uh, the lowest possible cost for charging. Are there any questions on this? It's not the first time we refer to your project in Enagaya, but it, this is uh, gaining shape. Uh, you have to find ways to uh, valorize that kilowatt hour, so perhaps it could be offered to employees. Yes, it could be uh, offered as a gift to Sanofi employees, but it can. It, it's also a way to optimize or to self-supply uh, on, on, on site. 
in other cases, you can always optimize charging depending on the price of electricity. This is what we are going to do on EDF sites. Now we are going to optimize self-supply, and this will be translate. This will translate into some advantages for employees, and then we can change the TCO, the total cost of ownership. All fleet operators try to reduce that cost, so that could be determining for wider fleets. For that specific client, we don't have canopies, but we, we do this for RATP, the uh, public transport operator in Paris. Uh, so first, this is really fundamental because there is an economic aspect, but also a global consistency. So the idea would really be to make sure that synergies that seem obvious on paper it could uh, come uh, be embodied in real life projects in a smart way, and then the most uh, beneficial way possible. So. Money is the, the key aspect. Don't hesitate to raise your hand in the audience in, in, if you have any question. So, uh, financially, how how uh, do you work? Do you get paid on part of the optimized consumption? Well, the solution is very simple. The payment is done initially on the basis of a, of a flat rate. And then the software is integrated to the supervisor, and companies like Sanofi have a chance via their uh, charging station uh, supervision scheme. They can change the price of charging. If an employee says, I get here at 8, but if you need my vehicle at 10, we're not going to wait until 12 to charge. So we're going to launch the charging immediately. So it protects the mobility needs of users, which remains our core priority. Jean-Luc says Val de Val. I have a question. When you want to optimize, is it, uh, uh, can you consider to have Canop is uh, east w with a west east west orientation as well uh, as a south north orientation. I think the most uh, canopies you have, the more PVs you have, the uh, uh, more energy you have. So I, I'm not I don't specialize in 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 this. Can someone uh, answer that question? Regarding the uh, orientation of uh, PVs, it's not very significant when you create a canopy. You must adapt uh, an existing design, an existing structure. You cannot rebuild the entire car park. Usually, the canopies are quite flat and they must be integrated. Perhaps we have some 10 degrees or so. Um, if you reach 14 degrees, uh, it's more difficult to integrate. If you have an east-west orientation, you'll have a different type of production. But it's not very significant. Uh, yes, it, it works when you have an east-west uh, orientation. Uh, the production is pretty similar. Uh, even uh, when uh, panels are flat on, on the rooftop. Perhaps next year it would, it would be interesting to have two or three conferences on the uh, V2G because it, it will be of interest for everyone. Yes, we had uh, this two years ago already, but you're right, it's uh, very interesting and there's a demand for this. Are there any other questions? Yes, I can see one hand raised and the second one over there. Hello, my name is Jürgen Tess for La Profi. I have a question for electric car manufacturers. You mentioned Nissan for bi-directional, but what's the situation with other manufacturers? 
Usually, they want to have their own batteries without conduction, but perhaps they have uh, some engines with 10,000 kilometers. This is very typical. Tongi, you don't sell cars, do you? But perhaps you can answer this question. Yes. There are many questions on the V2G technology. Occitan Yamase is the one which is best equipped with this system. Uh, partly thanks to Drive. So many questions are asked around this, and at present it's the uh, it is slowing down. At present, all manufacturers have uh, planned to integrate the V2G technology in their vehicles. Uh, all manufacturers have different schedules. I can only give you public information regarding Volkswagen, for instance, they said that they would have it in place uh, by this year. Renault has also announced that it is for 2025. Other major manufacturers, American or German, are about to make such announcements. So this is... Uh, Fully integrated. I mean that the V2G system works only if works only if there is no impact on the battery's lifespan, and that's a top priority for manufacturers. So technology is uh, almost up and ready. Jean do you want to answer as well? Yeah. Yeah, recently Volkswagen announced that it was updating its software. It's not hardware. So for all vehicles that have been sold to date are involved. But there is a question with the charging stations because the charging stations have not been designed to work in the both directions. The Renault 5, the next one, will be V2G. Renault has announced uh, innovations to incorporate V2G in their systems, in their batteries. So it's all happening. Uh, for V2G, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not sure if people want to uh, help the grid, but people could, uh, you could unload your battery when you're at home if you've been at work, and thanks to the, your boss, you've been able to charge up your car battery, then you can go back home and use that energy in your house. That might be more interesting. So uh, 7 p.m. in the evening, you could have your own heat pump or your, your, your cooker working at home. And then the next morning, if you want to charge your battery up again, then you'd have to use the low hours, the off-peak hours, to uh, use the grid to charge your battery up. There are a few models of, of car which will be able to do this, and hopefully next year that will be more, and we'll hopefully we'll have a workshop on that subject. Well, we'll note that down ready for next year. Another question at the back of the room. Yeah, I saw there's a young gentleman with his hand raised at the back of the room. Kindly introduce yourself. Hello. My name is Wesney. I'm a student at the high school. And I've got a question. If you were to sum this conference up with some relevant details, because there have been so much technical information that's been given, and I can't understand it all. I can't understand every detail. Could you just sum up your message in perhaps about three words that would sum up what we've, what we've heard this afternoon? That is a very difficult task you've given to us. First of all, to be relevant. It's not always obvious to be relevant and to sum things up in a few words so uh, Richard you've got uh, you've got the uh, hot potato well we know what the economy is of PV the, for recharging stations there are all kinds of models that are available either you could have a subscription or you could pay per kilowatt hour that's another model or it could be uh, in direct self-supply or not so there are different models there are many business models that exist and that work However, are you, is there a but there? But uh, we need to know what, uh, if, you've got the, if you're the site owner and you have, uh, need to buy a new transformer or you, and the, you're going to make uh, savings, you have to install canopies, there are use cases. So it's all to do with uh, the economy, what is possible and uh, we can enhance all of this by uh, new innovations. We've got COP28, which is just finished, and everyone's just wondering whether we should leave fossil fuels behind us. 
Should we slow down that phase out? Should we yeah, slow down the phase down? In France, we don't have any oil, but we do have sunshine, particularly down here in Occitania. And that pairing is very promising to decarbonize, decarbonize uh, our economy. And these will not only be heavy vehicles weighing one and a half uh, tons, we also have bicycles. Well, that's an interesting note. I don't know if you're satisfied with that. We're going to take two more minutes, perhaps another couple of questions on the side there. So well done for summing that up. Nice conclusion. Hello, my name is Paul. I am an apprentice from Toulouse, and I just want to know about the lifespan of your canopies. How many years does a canopy... If, if we're talking about a canopy with the recharging system integrated into it, yeah, what's, what's the average lifespan of what's been uh, installed so far? And what's the carbon footprint? Well, the carbon footprint has been calculated because in calls for tenders, we have to justify our carbon footprint. And so it's very, very good for PV. We, everyone knows about this. In two years, uh, we can uh, uh, offset the manufacturing cost. The carbon cost is carried by different foundations. We've got, uh, uh, we have got resistance to the wind. And so we've created 800 canopies over a couple of years. So we've got a lot of experience. We've worked on special foundations uh, using wells and uh, piles. And we try to divide by two or three the normal concrete footprint. And we've got partnerships with cement manufacturers to be able to put low carbon uh, concrete in there. And that requires commitment. We try to be low impact in everything we do and our commitment is to uh, work with government. When they make a low carbon uh, concrete, you have to make sure that you can do the entire silo and construct uh, a project in the same time window at the same time because you've got your silo there at the same time. So our, we've got um, constructors who are present in the room, they're involved in this uh, aspect because that's where your low carbon can come in in the framing and the frame has to be recyclable people have talked about hydrogen i am a firm believer in hydrogen to decarbonize our uh, industry and our factories and hydrogen in steel and in the future we'll have uh, low carbon steel and the lifespan of a canopy is going to be about if we're only talking about steel or wood when it's been galvanized, if you're talking about steel, then the lifespan will be 60, 70 years, 80 years. And the solar panels will follow technology in its progress. Today, we have yield guarantees for 25, 30 years um, for the uh, canopies, 10 years. And what about the charging stations? For the charging stations, well, if I understand the sector correctly, we're starting to have uh, some feedback on there. The first charging stations which were installed, their kind of technology has evolved since then. And so the plug systems have changed also. So we need some standards there. However, the charging stations themselves, we are just repowering the first ones. And now it's uh, a question of seeing whether today's uh, charging stations will last for long. Let's say three, five years, perhaps 10 years for some of them. But it's just the beginning of the market. The PV market is much more mature. So as far as the carbon f uh, footprint is concerned, I think that it can be very virtuous. And I haven't done that calculation yet. I really would like to say in a region such as Occitania, if you've put a canopy for 100 kilos, you'll be protecting 30 cars in the summer. What is the indirect savings that you will be made to the drivers who don't need to put their aircon on because their car has been in the shade all day? It will be interesting to calculate that, but it's an indirect impact, but uh, it uh, really is uh, important. And a final point, the question uh, when you ask us to sum things up, I think the summing up is easy. It's go for it. Let's act. Let's do things. And I'd like to send a message to the Occitania region. We're in a wonderful uh, 
setting here at Nagaya and outside in the car park you do not have any canopies. What are you waiting for? Go and put those canopies out in the car park here, now, today. Thank you very much for that conclusion. Thank you very much to our panel members. Enjoy the rest of the uh, trade show and we'll be back in 10 minutes for our final round table. It's all about re-industrializing the European PV industry.